everybody and welcome to today's JSPS Pathology Grand Rounds for the October Round, uh, sponsored by the Jean Shanks Foundation and the Pathological Society, as usual. And can I ask all audience members, uh, if you have questions to ask, please can you type your questions in the Q&A box, which you should see a button for at the bottom of your screens. Thank you. Now, today gives me great pleasure to welcome our speaker, who is Professor Roel Verhaak. He's the Florine Deschen Rue Chair and Associate Director of Computational Biology at the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine at Farmington, Connecticut, USA. His lab studies glioma using genomic characterization and computational analyses. And this is work that has helped to redefine the way in which glioma in adult patients is classified. His more recent efforts have been focused on tumour evolution, in which the lab is investigating using longitudinal tumour sequencing, single cell sequencing, and using comparative oncology approaches. Roll has been the recipient of the AAAS Wachtel Award, the Agilent Early Career Professor Award, and the Peter Steck Memorial Award. He is a co-founder of Boundless Bio, a biotech company developing therapies against cancers containing extra chromosomal DNA amplifications. And that is the core topic of his lecture to us today. His lecture is entitled Extra Chromosomal DNA Amplifications in Cancer. Thank you very much, Roel, and over to you. Thanks so much for that very kind introduction. Let me uh, share my screen. Um, I hope I'm sharing the full screen, but if that's not the case, please do let me know. Yes, that looks fine. Perfect, thank you. So I'd like to thank Mark for the introduction and of course Marnix uh, who invited me to speak here today uh, for, the, uh, for the kind uh, invitation. Um, as uh, mentioned, uh, the topic of today's seminar is extrachromosomal DNA amplifications in cancer. So I, as introduced, I'm a, a researcher at Jax in Connecticut, sort of on the east coast of the US. But these days I also have an affiliation with the Department of Neurosurgery in Amsterdam, uh, at the Amsterdam UMC. All right, so I have two disclosures. Um, so my lab has been studying the genomics of glioma since about 2010. And we started by uh, uh, reanalyzing or analyzing data from the cancer gene genome atlas, the TCGA, um, and in particular studying glioblastoma, as you know, the most uh, aggressive form of glioma in adult patients. So through work with the TCGA, um, it was shown that the majority of glioblastomas carry somatic alterations in three core pathways. Of course, there's many other things going on in glioblastoma, but this was a major finding coming out of the earliest TCGA work. And that includes, a little bit small, but it includes the, um, let me pull up a laser pointer, and the receptor tyrosine kinase pathway, the P53 signaling pathway, and the RB1 cell cycle pathway. This is from the 2008 original TCGA paper and a reproduction of this from um, the, the later 2013 paper in the TCGA. Now, if you look at these pathways in more detail, there's a number of genes there, a number of proteins that get activated through genomic amplification. So this includes genes like EGFR, PDGFRA, and MET. So somatic, uh, sorry, a focal high-level copy amplification is an important mechanism that drives the activation and deactivation of these, uh, these key pathways. Now, oncogene amplification, it's long been known, can happen via either linear duplications, which then are showing up in cytogenetic uh, stains as homogeneous staining regions or HSRs, or it can occur extrachromosomally. And these extrachromosomal DNA elements have traditionally been labeled double minutes. Now, extrachromosomal DNA in cancer, or ECDNA in short, as we have uh, relabeled it more recently, um, 
are circular DNA elements that range in size from 50 kilobases to about five megabases. These are certainly not by any means hard cutoffs, but sort of the spread of what we typically see. A key uh, characteristics, characteristic of ECDNA is that it does not contain centromeres. And this is important for the way these elements are inherited. And I'll get back to that later. And <clears throat> it should never be forgotten that the first and foremost mechanism of, or purpose, I should say, of an ECDNA is to amplify and thereby to activate an oncogene or an oncogenic, oncogenic element. Just a little bit of history. So ECDNA were first described by uh, researchers at Oxford University in this paper on the left in The Lancet, um, where the authors observed uh, in metaphase spreads from a neuroblastoma cell, and neuroblastoma is a prototypical ECDNA-driven disease. The authors observed these little spec uh, speckles that typically happen in pairs. So they labeled these speckles as minute bodies, small bodies, and because they happened in pairs, they were uh, quickly referred to as double minutes. A little bit more than a decade later, double minutes in neuroblastoma were able to were related to homo, uh, homogeneously staining regions. And this is miss calling it homozygously staining regions. So it was uh, in this paper and work by um, Fred Ald and uh, Bob Shimke and others was shown to that uh, the uh, the ECDNAs were consisting of the same type of sequence as that was making up HSR sequence. So there was a correlation. It was first found that double minutes actually were potentially a mechanism for genomic duplication. And then again, a few years later, the sequence on these ECDNAs, on these double minutes, was related to an oncogene. So then it became apparent that ECDNA is a mechanism for oncogene amplification. Now, this is 1982, but since then, there was, there's been a long uh, period of relatively little progress in our understanding of ECDNA. Around 2013, my lab initiated a collaboration with Anna de Carvalho and her, um, her mentor, Tom Nicholson, who are both researchers at uh, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. And in my lab, trainee Hoon Kim was the, was the main driver of this particular project. So with Anna and Tom, who are also interested in studying glioma, we developed a project where Tom and Anna would um, collect tissues from, glio from patients with a glioblastoma. They would culture these cells as neurospheres, neurosphere cultures, and they would uh, xenograft these cells orthotopically, uh, intracranially in nude mice. They would then expand the cells and uh, uh, collect them after a period of time and send them to us for sequencing. And we would then do sequencing of the glioblastoma tumor, the neurosphere uh, cult cell culture derived from the tumor and the xenografts derived from the cell culture. And the sequencing included exome, whole genome, and RNA sequencing, and even some long read sequencing. So that was a very uh, fruitful collaboration that ultimately culminated in a publication in 2018. So one of the things we observed by studying these sets of tumors um, was the progress, the propagation of somatic alterations as cells were, were cultured and as cells were xenografted. So this is one particular patient, and we're focusing in, we're zooming in on, a, on the MYC gene here. And then this particular tumor, the MYC locus is actually wild type in the original GDM. But when the cells were cultured, a uh, MYC, focal MYC amplification consisting of two DNA segments could be uh, detected. And this exact same focal amplification was subsequently also detected in the three, three xenograft models derived from the um, from the neurosphere cells. And by connecting our sequencing data, uh, we were able to find that these DNA segments were um, uh, linked. There was a connection between them. And this connection existed on both sides. And if you don't follow the path, you can already start to see that this is actually a circle. So this gave away that this was likely an extra chromosomal DNA amplification because of its circularity. 
Um, and when we then performed both interface <coughs> and metaphase fish, especially the metaphase fish uh, can, uh, is clearly showing that this MEK amplification is extra chromosomal. So in this study, we repeated a similar approach for many of the focal amplifications we detected. And the FISH experiments always would, were able to confirm that the, the whole genome sequencing derived hypothesis that many of these amplifications indeed are circular and extra chromosomal. So genomic structure is predictive of the presence of an extra chromosomal DNA element. You can use, you can reanalyze, or you can analyze whole genome sequencing to predict the presence of an EC DNA. One interesting observation to us was that was that it helped to show the dynamic nature of ECDNA. Here's our here are two tumor samples, HF3035 and HF3077. And in both the tumor samples, we detected a focal amplification of the MET gene. This amplification is actually pretty straightforward. It seems to consist of one single segment, one focal uh, DNA um, segment amplification. And it's different, even though it looks similar, it's different between the two tumors. If you closely zoom in on the boundaries of the DNA segments, you'll find that they are different. Therefore, the uh, amplifications are actually independent of one another. Now, when cells from these two tumors were, were, were uh, expanded in culture, this MET amplification is largely gone. So it appears that there has been a clonal selection process of, of a tumor that consisted partially of cells with a MET amplification. But in culture, there's some selection against cells with a MET amplification, and therefore, the, in culture, that MET amplification disappears. But once these cells were intracranially injected in mice, we can re-detect the exact same amplification. Again, look at the copy at the, the DNA segment boundaries. This is the exact same amplification. So now when the cells were put back into the brains, into their quote unquote natural environment, there's a selection for cells containing MET. And therefore the MET amplification reappears. So this is suggestive of a very strong selective pressure, uh, first against the MET containing cells and then for MET containing cells. And here's just the fish evidence that indeed this is an extra chromosomal amplification. Um, and you'll have to take my word that this was true for both, uh, both tumors. Now, what was interesting, and this is just showing data from HF3035, is that when we analyzed the exome sequencing data for the presence of point mutations, what we were expecting to see, given how strong the clonal selection process appears to be, it appears to be mostly MET containing cells to almost no MET containing cells to mostly containing MET containing cells. And this was also confirmed by our FISH analyses, is that we were not able to find such a pattern amongst the point mutation data. So these are all point mutations detected in the tumor sample. And the, the, the coloring actually represents the, clon the clonal fraction. And you can see there's a cluster, a C1 cluster of mutations that is clonal. So these are mutations present in all tumor cells of all the five subsequent uh, uh, tumor specimens. Um, what we did not find were mutations present in the primary tumor, depleted in the, in the neurosphere and reoccurring in the reappearing in the xenocrafts. So this was a first hint about the disparate, the discordant inheritance propagation of ECDNA elements versus point mutations, versus point mutations detected on linear chromosomes. So this is suggestive of a model where we have a tumor with different subclones as indicated by the coloring. And these different subclones, most cells contain ECDNA. Once these tumor, once these uh, cells were expanded in a neurosphere setting, there's new subclones that reappear. You know, for example, C2 here, and the ECDNA is sort of distributed over the different uh, mutational subclones. And when the when the cells were then put into xenografts, these independent subclones containing ECDNA were the ones that were the driver of the reoccurrence. So this is a very different evolutionary um, and clonal selection process than maybe what we would have envisioned to be happening on the basis of linear DNA only. 
there appear to be almost two separate evolutionary forces, one selecting for cells with or without ECDNA, and then presumably there's other forces selecting for mutational subclones, like the C2 cluster that now is nearly derived in the neurospheres. Now, as I mentioned, we did some long read sequencing, and this is actually these two MET amplifications, or these are the specimens containing the MET amplification. And using long read sequencing, we were able to fine map the precise structure of the ECDNAs. So even though it, they appear as single segments, actually, when you look closely, there's actually an ECDNA here of seven independent DNA segments, and this contains two segments, the one on the right and the one on the left is approximately, they're both about 200 kilobases. And the one on the left actually has very high coverage. It has about, it's about a 400 fold amplification, an unbelievable number of, uh, of uh, met, um, uh, um, an unbelievable level of amplification. And um, the one on the right is actually about 25 fold uh, amplified. Now, a key finding here was that using this long read sequencing data, we were not able to detect the presence of centromeres. You can always question whether the reads would have been long enough to detect any such sequence. Um, but I think this is quite suggestive of the absence of centromeres on these, uh, on these um, uh, elements. Now that combined with the discordance in inheritance of the circular ECDNA elements and the linear chromosomes containing these point mutation, is quite strongly indicative of an of a um, inheritance mechanism where chromosomal alterations follow, you know, Mendelian rules, uh, and a parental cell gives rise to two identical daughter cells, but not true for extra chromosomal DNA. For ECDNA, what we find is that there's a parental cell, and upon replication, upon segregation of chromosomal material, one daughter cell may have most of the ECDNAs, whereas the other has none. And how exactly it is determined which cell receives which amount of ECDNA appears to be mostly stochastic. And I'll have data to show that for you later. But this is an important um, characteristic of ECDNA because, but because once you start to have cells that contain many, many copies of an ECDNA, and there's a selective pressure or cells containing many copies of ECDNA, this can quickly then help a, a tumor acquire a large subclone that's dominated, that's driven by the presence of the ECDNA, the oncogenic signal that is um, uh, propagated through the presence of that ECDNA. So non mendelian inheritance combined with clonal selection causes rapid ECDNA accumulation. And that's exactly what we saw for these two cases with and without the MET amplification. Now, a next question that we asked is, okay, this is interesting and clearly for this small set of tumors that we analyzed, the presence of ECDNA is important. Um, and suggesting that actually the presence of extra chromosomal DNA may be quite, um, frequent for glioblastomas, but glioblastomas are fortunately very rare tumors. So in the next uh, analysis, in the next study, we asked what is the incidence of extrachromosomal DNA amplification in cancer? And maybe to remind you that relatively recently, this is a study from 2011, large cytogenetic studies suggested that extrachromosomal DNA is actually detected in you know, just about 1% of all cancers. Now, through computational analysis, as we showed, as I just showed you, computational analysis of whole genome sequencing data, we're able to detect circular extrachromosomal amplicons. So our close collaborator, Vinit Bafna at UCSD, formalized this process in a tool called Amplicon Architect. So the Amplicon Architect tool takes whole genome sequencing data. It basically starts from a seed interval, you know, all the, uh, all the genomic segments above a certain threshold of coverage, and then expands these seeds by mapping sequencing data, uh, sequencing reads, until it can detect circles. That's the simple uh, process that's being followed here. So we started to use Amplicon Architect in our analyses in collaboration with Vineet, and actually also in collaboration with Paul Michel at Stanford, now at Stanford. And 
we applied Amplicon Architect on sets of whole genome sequencing data. And first we would use that information to classify all amplicons we could detect in a given tumor sample. And amplicons were defined as all DNA segments of at least four copies and at least 10 kilobases across a tumor sample, across a tumor genome. So we first identified all amplicons containing the signature of a breakage fusion bridge using a separate tool developed by Zenit. And this was because it's not uh, it's less than straightforward to separate the signal of breakage fusion bridges from that of a circular DNA. And we wanted to be conservative in our approach. So once all BFBs were set aside, um, of the remaining amplicons where a circular path could be derived, we labeled those amplicons as circular. And then subsequently, we had two separate classes of linear amplification. And finally, of course, the rest of the genome is not amplified. And then we used the amplicon information to label tumor samples. And here we reversed the order. So all tumor samples containing at least one circular DNA were labeled as circular, quote unquote, tumor samples. And then down the, down the line, you know, BFB samples have, and otherwise heavily arranged or linear samples. And finally, no amplifications. So when we used this um, classification approach, uh, on a set of more than 3,000 tumor samples for which whole genome sequencing data was available, and these were tumors from the TCGA and the ICGC and so forth, we observed this distribution where all uh, the, where the fraction in red represents the fraction of tumor samples in a given tumor type uh, with circular DNA. So indeed, glioblastoma is the tumor type with relatively the highest fraction of samples containing circular DNA. So perhaps it's no surprise that you know, we were uh, finding this in our small study with, with Anna and Tom. Um, other tumor types with where circular DNA is highly frequently detected include sarcoma, esophageal cancer, and ovarian cancer. And we published this work just a few years ago, together with you know, Hun and, and Nam. Nam at that time, a postdoc in Vinit's lab, uh, shared first obviously. So, through that work, but also certainly the work of others, we now start to find that ECDNA can be detected at diagnosis in most cancer types. That doesn't mean that ECDNA can be detected in most cancers, but in a fraction of all cancer types, including pediatric cancer um, uh, as well. And we also know that the presence of ECDNA associates with poor patient survival. So this is from our earlier study. And you can see the Kepler-Meyer curve of the red, uh, the red line uh, shows the, the um, relatively shortest median survival. The red uh, indicates samples with a circular DNA. Now, of course, there's enrichment of glioblastoma, sarcomas, and so forth in the circular group. But even in, in a multivariate analysis where we account for, um, uh, where we account for uh, tumor lineage, we find that the presence of a circular DNA is independently um, associated with poor patient survival. You might ask, what are the genes that are amplified on extra chromosomal DNA? And the answer is that they are by and large the same as genes commonly known to be amplified. So on the left is a gistic plot from a study by Ramin Baruchem and colleagues from 2013, a pan-cancer analysis of, of genomic amplifications they showed that genes like MIC-L, uh, PDGFRA, EGFR, and so forth were, are frequently amplified. And in our study, we find that exactly those genes are the ones that are most frequently detected on ECDNAs. Now, this is all interesting biology, but of course, the next question we and others, many others are asking ourselves is whether ECDNA is a new target for anti-cancer therapy. And this is because Targeted inhibitors like trastuzumab and HER2 amplified or HER2 amplified breast cancers have significantly improved patient outcomes. So these are inhibitors of oncogenes. Many oncogenes are currently undruggable, however, like MYC, TERT, and the cyclins. And these are frequently extrachromosomally amplified. So is HERB2, by the way. And one suggestion is that perhaps instead of targeting the specific gene, perhaps we can target the ECDNA structure, the circular structure 
and the concept that it's, for example, an evilly inherited. There's like it seems likely that there's specific biology underlying the behavior of ECDNA. Now, if ECDNAs are cancer drivers, which you know strongly suggested by our work and the work of others, it would make sense if they were maintained over time. If you could detect ECDNA at an early time point, it should then be maintained at a later time point. The Hartwig Medical Foundation is a, a, a foundation in the Netherlands who is performing whole genome sequencing of advanced cancers. So in our initial study, we analyzed tumors at diagnosis. The Hartwig is adding on to that um, the availability of the, that data by sequencing advanced cancers. So cancers from uh, tumor specimens from metastases, either in the lymph node or other parts of the body, patients who have extensively undergone prior treatment and so forth. So we analyzed nearly 3,000 samples from the Hardwick Medical Foundation cohort. It's really a wonderful data set. Um, and find that amongst these advanced cancers, the frequency, the number of samples uh, containing at least one ECDNA is strongly enriched in comparison to the TCGA ICGC primary diagnostic tumor cohort. So in that initial cohort, the, the total frequency was approximately 10 to 14%. Amongst the Hartwick set, it's 33% of tumors containing at least one ECDNA. Again, glioblastomas are is the tumor type with the highest relative proportion, followed by esophageal cancer, uterine cancer, and so on and so forth. Um, sarcoma is actually a bit down the line, it's here, but that's because the distribution of, of, of sarcoma subtypes is different between the heartbreak set and the TCGA ICGC set. Now, um, we then did a direct comparison within tumor lineages and find that indeed also within a tumor lineage, we see a significant increase in the relative penetrance of ECDNA. For example, amongst esophageal cancer, and we limited our analysis to uh, uh, subsets where we had at least 30 samples. Um, for example, esophageal cancer, the relative frequency goes from 23% to 66%. Breast cancer from 16% to 50% stomach from 22% to 43%, and so on and so forth. So this is the, the increase in ECDNA frequency is not because we have a different distribution of cancer types between the two large cohorts, but because, but because within tumor types, there's significantly more cancer samples containing at least one ECDNA. And the presence of at least one ECDNA applicant continues to associate with worse outcomes. So the, the three lines on top are from our earlier study, actually, the newly diagnosed cancers. Now, also within the Hartwig set, where, again, these are advanced cancers, so their outcomes are significantly worse than the newly diagnosed cancer cohort. But also within that subset, we find a significant disadvantage for, for patients whose tumors are driven in part by ECDNA. Conceptually, this actually makes somewhat sense to me in the sense that if there are different rules for tumor evolution for cells containing ECDNA and those that do not, then it provides tumor samples with an extra layer of defense, an extra way to circumvent any kind of limitations in the tumor microenvironment. And it's kind of evolutionary bottlenecks. So to me, it makes sense that tumors containing ECDNA have worse outcomes. Um, so this is the two, same two uh, long, re long read sequencing reconstructed ECDNAs that I showed earlier, again, with their relative uh, proportions. Just showing this to indicate that we can use sequencing data to reconstruct in silico the ECDNA structures, and that we can use this information to measure things like amplicon complexity, what's the number of DNA segments, what's the number of breakpoints, um, what's the level of copy number or the variation in copy number within, uh, within an ECDNA and so forth. And of course, we can map ECDNA size. So we did exactly that analysis uh, for both the set of initial tumors, the primary tumors from TCGA-ICGC, and we did this for our new cohort 
uh, of hardwick specimens. And then we further separated ECDNAs into, uh, uh, ECDNAs into those that contain an oncogene and those that do not contain an oncogene. So first evaluating complexity, we see that, um, first of all, that uh, ECDNAs containing an oncogene are more complex than ECDNAs that do not contain an oncogene. Second, we observe that there's a significant increase in complexity between the uh, ECDNAs detected amongst primary cancers versus those amongst detected in advanced cancers. So over time, it appears that the amplicons become more complex. Finally, this is also the case exactly for not for linear amplicons, for ECDNA negative amplicons. So this effect of increase in complexity is not specific to ECDNA. We see a similar effect for um, uh, linear ampl amplicons. And of course, because there's more complexity, there's also a difference in size. Uh, oh, this is actually the wrong figure. I, make, I missed them up. Max, <laughs> I copied the wrong figure. As you can see in the y-axis, this is actually showing copy number. Um, so you have to wait and take my word for it. Um, there's also a, a significant increase in amplicon size uh, between the primary cancers and the advanced cancers. And again, this is true for both ECDNA amplicons and for linear amplicons. The next point I was going to make is that um, the copy number, the number of copies per cell or the number of the average median, the average number of copies across a tumor specimen as determined by whole genome sequencing is significantly decreased. So on the left, we see this for ECDNA containing amplicons. We see that in primary cancers, the median amplicon number across the whole set is about 16X. Whereas amongst the heart rate cohort, this is about seven or eight X. So we see that there's fewer copies. This is a bit paradoxical. On one hand, we see more ECDNAs. On the other hand, those ECDNAs seem to have lower copy number. I mean, this is not so much the case, by the way, for the linear ECDNA neg negative amplicons. We don't really see much difference there. I guess a little difference, but not, not much. Um, when we then plotted uh, the distribution of ECDNAs by copy number, uh, uh, grouping ECDNAs into different categories, we find that actually the number of very high level copy number uh, amplicons is the, the frequency of amplicons with very high numbers of copies is comparable between the two cohorts. Um, so we find about 160 high number, high copy number amplicons amongst the TCGA set and about 130 amongst the Harvick set. So that's, you know, somewhat comparable. Um, the major increase in ECDNAs is is contributed by relatively low copy number ECDNAs. So amongst the hardware set, there are more ECDNAs, but they're mostly at lower copy number. This could be suggestive of subclonality, although we haven't formally done that analysis yet. So in the next step, um, we actually started to look at tumor samples where we had data from multiple time points. So here's one example of a, a glioblastoma tumor that contains an extra chromosomal amplification with the oncogenes EGFR and CDK4, both on the same structure. Here's EGFR and there's CDK4. And these are on different chromosomes, chromosome seven and respectively chromosome 12, but you can see the, the numerous sequencing reads that connect these two genomic segments. Time point two of that same tumor, now you, you can appreciate that the amplification has become a lot more complex many more lines. And actually there's a third oncogene that has appeared on the amplicon. The MIC amplicon, the MIC G oncogene has been sort of added to that uh, ECDNA structure. If you look at copy number, uh, the y-axis here, you know, average copy number here is probably about you know 35X or something like that. Um, and the recurrent sample is actually a little lower. It appears to be more like 20X if I had to eyeball the average copy number for this particular structure. So that's just to give you an indication of what this looks like. Here's another example of a breast cancer 
Um, of course, we the, the the previous example was in a glioblastoma, where the where we always look at tumor recurrence rather than metastasis. Metastasis is relatively rare in glioblastomas. This is a breast cancer, um, where we don't have data from the initial tumor at diagnosis. We do know that this patient received chemo and hormone therapy. And when a bone metastasis was subsequently identified and sequenced, we find that in this bone metastasis, there's a cyclin D1 amplification on an ECDNA. Patient then received additional hormone therapy for about 11, 11 months and then developed a liver metastasis and that um, nearly same, just by eyeballing here again, nearly same cyclin D1 amplification can be redetected. So this is an ECDNA that uh, is found in two different sites in the body at different time points, suggesting perhaps that this is a truncal event. We can formalize the similarity between these two structures using a tool, using the Amplicon similarity tool developed by Jens Lubeck and Vinny Bafna and, and colleagues, um, and estimate that the Amplicon similarity here is 0.82. Hand in, that number goes hand in hand with this, with the quote unquote genomic similarity. For this particular tumor, tumor pair, we find that 78% of the mutations detected in the first time point tumor were also recovered in the second time point tumor. So this tumor actually by and large was quite similar be uh, between the two time points, both by point mutations as well as by, by extra chromosomal DNA amplicons. So by combining data from the Hartwig cohort with data from the glioma longitudinal analysis uh, consortium, we were able to compile a set of 154 patients with at least two time point whole genome sequencing data. We then ran a similar analysis where we uh, classified every amplicon across both time points into whether they are circular, yes or no, ECDNA positive or negative. And, and then we compared for those with high similarity, whether their classification was, was the same. And we find that for most uh, circular DNAs detected at time point one, that they are still circular at time point two. Um, and the same is true for the linear amplicons, the East DNA kind of amplicons. Uh, there's not really much change in, uh, in classification. There are really interesting uh, uh, phenomena to be observed amongst this set of longitudinal uh, sequences. For example, here we have a tumor sample where in terms of point mutation, the tumor is actually very similar. 85% of mutations detected at time point one. Again, uh, this, is a, this is a glioblastoma tumor. 85% of the T1 mutations are recovered at T2. So this is a very similar tumor despite the presence of chemo and radiotherapy. But the amplicon that results in amplification of EGFR is actually quite different. We see here an EGFR amplification that has this structure, and, here's a di and there's a different structure at time point two, and indeed the amplicon similarity is relatively low. So this is an example of converging evolution, where the tumor uh, seems to develop the same genomic alteration twice. We also see reverse, re reverse uh, patterns. For example, here are two cases where the mutational overlap is very low. So this is a, a lung cancer, a lymph node uh, metastasis, and a peritoneal uh, metastasis uh, with some time in between. The, the, the mutational overlap is very low between in, in this particular pair, but the amplicon similarity is very high, suggesting uh, an evolutionary pattern that's largely driven by the ECDNA. And here's another such, such example, even lower mutational overlap, but very high amplicon similarity. Um, when we took that cohort of 154 samples, uh, 154 sample pairs, and grouped them by whether mutational overlap was low or whether the mutational overlap was high, and then evaluated the similarity of the amplicons, we find that ECDNA similarity is high independent of mutational similarity, but that, as you would expect, for linear amplicons, the similarity 
over the two time points goes hand in hand with the mutational similarity. This makes sense because linear amplicons are you know, chromosomal as the point mutations are. And of course, the circular amplicons are extra chromosomal. Um, in the next analysis led by Kevin Anderson, who is a postdoc in the lab, we evaluated the presence of ECDNA at the single cell or really the single nucleus level because we did single nuclei sequencing. And we did this using the multi ohm platform, the simultaneous DNA or chromatin accessibility and transcriptome sequencing. Uh, so this is a 10x multi ohm platform. With collaborators, we retrieved uh, glioblastoma specimens that we then cut in two parts. Uh, one part to be um, directed for whole genome sequencing. And we used the whole genome sequencing then to uh, detect ECDNAs using the Amplicon Architect tool. Another part of the spe specimen was sent for multi ohm single cell ATAC chromatin accessibility and RNA sequencing. Um, we then used that data to separate non tumor cells from tumor cells. And amongst the tumor cells, we further classified those in whether they contained ECDNA, yes or no, by combining the signals from both the chromatin accessibility profile and the transcriptome profile. So only cells where both DNA and RNA showed enough coverage of the ECDNA locus and suggested that there was an amplification were classified as ECDNA containing. I should perhaps point out that because ECDNAs tend to be highly amplified, that there's an enrichment uh, at the ECDNA locus in all of these cells, if there's an ECDNA present, yes or no. So here's one tumor sample that has an EGF, combined EGFR and CDK4 amplification. It's actually the same one as I showed earlier. And when we looked at the single cell data, we find that about a third of the tumor cells contain an ECDNA and the other uh, two thirds or so are negative or we didn't have coverage of the sufficient coverage of the locus. So about a third of the single nuclei seem to amplify uh, the ECDNA, whereas the rest is wild type. When we then looked at the second time point, uh, we see that this fraction has gone down quite substantially. So there's relatively few tumor cells uh, that contain the ECDNA. Um, this is perhaps somewhat expected because we also found that the copy number went down between the two time points. So we see uh, in the whole genome sequencing data where of course you use a hammer to uh, flatten the whole profile across many single cells. We see lower copy numbers. So perhaps not as super surprising that we also find fewer single nuclei, single cells containing the ECDNA. Um, this is zooming in of the expression levels in single cells. So the each of the rows here are single cells of the ECDNA locus. And what I think is interesting is that here's EGFR um, uh, in, in blue um, and CDK4. So the blue indicates high levels of expression of EGFR and CDK4. And uh, this is limited by the way to only cells containing the ECDNA. When we do the same analysis for the recurring time point, we see that MIC is actually only expressed in uh, that the, there's a clear separation between cells expressing MIC and cells expressing EGFR and CDK4. So even though the whole genome sequencing data implied that there's one single structure containing all three oncogenes, the single cell data shows that actually the MIC amplicon is on a separate, uh, is, is only is separated, is a, is a separate clone from the EGFR CDK4 clone. So we had four pairs of tumors where we could evaluate ECDNA at the single cell level, all glioblastomas. And we find, and you know, there's only four specimens, uh, four tumors, so we don't know how, how, how generalizable this is, but we find that in all four cases, the relative fraction of um, tumor cells uh, containing ECDNA is decreased at recurrence. Now, as I've extensively pointed out, um, we, but also others like Paul Michel, have shown that uh, ECDNAs are circular and that they lack centromeres. On the left is our sequencing data. On the right is a paper from Paul Michel's group who used electron and, and confocal microscopy to, to demonstrate the circularity, for example, of ECDNA. And as I've mentioned before, this ECDNA results, the presence the ECDNA is segregated unevenly during mitosis. This results in unevenness of 
the number of ECDNA copies across cells and derives intratumoral heterogeneity. So we tried to evaluate the heterogeneity of ECDNAs within tumor samples using FISH by counting the number of ECDNA signals um, uh, using in, in FISH images. So here's one patient sample where we colored, where we stained for the EGFR gene and counted the number of EGFR signals across a set of, of cells and, uh, um, and also counted the number of chromosome 7 signals. And as you can appreciate, there's a very different distribution for EGFR, a much more spread distribution for the number of EGFR signals relative to the number of chromosome 7 signals. The, uh, this is chromosome 7 centromere. And we observed a similar pattern for other tumor samples as well as for a few of our cell cultures. And uh, this is not limited to glioblastoma. Um, uh, these are data from a number of cell lines, also including many non uh, brain tumor cell lines. So the MAD, the maximum, uh, sorry, the median absolute deviation is significantly higher for ECDNA signals relative to linear signals, showing that indeed there's much more heterogeneity of ECDNAs within tumor samples relative to linear um, samples, a uh, linear uh, DNA uh, segments. So in Hee Yi, uh, who's a postdoc in the lab, who's actually on the, the faculty job market right now, um, decided to trace this heterogeneity in live cells. And to do so, she developed a DEATCAS9 mediated uh, tool to visualize ECDNA breakpoints. And this is called the ECTAG system. So in short, guide RNAs are uh, synthesized to align exactly to a ECDNA breakpoint, which should be unique DNA sequence only found on ECDNAs. The guide has a till containing puff binding sites and their puff can bind, the puffs can bind to the puff binding site and then contain a clover, which is then ultimately the fluorescent signal. So this is just to show you that this works by uh, combining um, fish with our EC tag uh, tool to show you the convergence of the signal um, uh, and even formalized here. So we then used EC tag to track ECDNA signal over time. And answering the primary question, whether indeed there's uneven segregation of ECDNA following mitosis. So here we have one cell and the signal is quite weak, um, but we think it's convincing enough. Um, one cell that pre-mitosis contains a number of signals. Uh, we seem to lose the signal again when the uh, cell undergoes mitosis, presumably because the DNA at that point is so condensed that the guides cannot access the, EC, the, the, the DNA. But as the cell exits mitosis, we start to pick up the signal again. And ultimately the point here is that at the end of the mitotic process, there's a difference in the number of signals between the two daughter cells. Oops. Um, and when we counted uh, the distribution or when we counted ECDNA signals for daughter cells, or a number of different uh, mitotic processes, we indeed see that there's little correlation between the, the number of ECDNA copies and the two daughters. Whereas, of course, with two control lo loci, chromosome 7 and MERC4, we see that there's a very strong linear um, correlation. Using EC tag and time lapse imaging, we also noticed that ECDNAs tend to have tend to converge to the same location within. Um, within the nucleus. So this is one such example over a, a short time series of two ECDNA signals coming together. And we have other examples where ECDNA signals come together and we never really observe that for chromosomal signals. Now, of course, there are a lot of signals. There are a lot of ECDNA copies in a given nucleus. So perhaps it's just random. Perhaps just because there are so many copies of ECDNA, you also sometimes happen to see a clustering of the ECDNA molecules. But when we measured the, the time duration of the interactions, we see that this is relatively stable for ECDNA interactions. We then contrasted this to telomere interactions. And of course, each cell contains at least 46 telomeres, presumably, and, and find that, um, actually it's 92 because telomeres are on both sides, um, find that for telomeres, 
there, uh, these interactions also occur, but are much more random, sporadic, and short-lived. So there seems to be some system to the ECDNA interactions. And we also found that um, in many cells, in at least half the cells, we measure um, imaged over a certain time window. And I think the time window here is important. So we image for at least 48 hours. We find that on that over that time window, we see clustering of ECDNA. We also found through staining experiments that there's co-localization of the ECDNA clusters with RNA pol 2 And this seems to be preferential. So the RNA pol 2 seems to preferentially converge with the ECDNA hubs, as we've started to call them now, suggesting that ECDNA hubs are actually a prime um, mechanism for uh, expression for transcriptional activity of the cargo genes residing on the ECDNA. So we showed this in our paper, and uh, which was published uh, jointly with a paper by Howard Chang's lab, who also found the uh, evidence supporting ECDNA hubs and ECDNA hubs being the drivers of transcriptome expression. So um, as I'm closing in on the full hour, I just have a few more slides to show you. So we then also in parallel used the Chia PET method, which is a, a method, uh, uh, which is the chromatin interaction analysis by paired end tag sequencing Chia PET. Um, and we applied Chia PET after selecting e DNA, pulling down e DNA, DNA using an RNA pol 2 antibody. So basically, Chia PET measures chromosome chromosome interactions. And in this instance, we first pulled down RNA pol 2 bound DNA and then measured DNA interactions uh, where RNA pol 2 had, had bound. So basically, these are transcriptionally active sites. We measured chromosome interactions at transcriptionally active sites. So here's the, the Chia PET signal for two ECDNAs, one in HF2927 and another ECDNA in HF2354. The HF3035 signal of the same locus is shown here for, for comparison. So this is zooming in on a EGFR amplification, respectively a MIC amplification. And the Chia PET signal is highly, um, a lot of Chia PET signal for this particular locus. There's even a complete hairball um, plots suggesting that, uh, that within ECDNAs, there's many interactions. And intuitively, this makes sense. I picture this as ECDNAs floating around in the nucleus and bumping into each other or forming hubs. Therefore, it's, it's totally reasonable to expect lots of ECDNA, ECDNA interactions. Perhaps what was more surprising is that when we normalized the number of interactions across the genome, um, basically counting the number of interactions across 100 KB bins, we see a very high number of interactions specifically for the ECDNA locus. And this was still true after correcting for the relative number of copies of ECDNA. So it appeared that RNA pol 2 bound ECDNA are making, are making genome wide connections. We then measured H3K27 acetylase using chip sequencing and then split the genome of four different ECDNA containing neurospear models into three groups. The first group is H3K1027 acetylation of the ECDNA itself. The second group is H3K27 acetylation of those domains where ECDNA is um, making a connection to a linear DNA segment. And, and then finally, the rest of the genome. And the consistent pattern we're seeing and what we're finding is that where ECDNA is making a connection, there's a higher uh, uh, H3K27 acetylation signal, suggesting that these are transcript that, these, that, that the ECDNA is preferentially making a connection to regions that are poised for transcription. And then finally, when we plot expression, uh, transcription uh, for genes close to uh, domains where ECDNA is making a connection versus other genes, 
we see this increased uh, level of expression to be very significant, suggesting that ECDNA not only uh, through clustering through ECDNA hub formation um, drives intra ECDNA transcription, but is also driving transcription of linear genes, which I think is quite interesting for biology. So last two slides, actually I'll, I'll end it here. So when we think about targeting of ECDNA of ECDNAs, how can we use ECDNA for development of new therapeutic modalities? There's at least four options that we can think of. First, we might be able to target the ECDNA formation, so the formation of the circular um, elements, which is clearly important given the increase in ECDNA frequency at, at, in advanced cancers. It seems, seems intuitive that there's biology specifically replicating ECDNA and segregating ECDNA that we haven't discovered yet. And then finally, an, a direct option for therapeutic development is to block the function of ECDNAs, for example, by breaking up the hubs that I just um, described. I want to end here. Uh, thank all the collaborators, uh, Chai Lin Wei for the TFET analysis, Paul Michel and Vinit Bafna for the pan cancer and genomic analyses. Uh, of course, our funding agencies, in particular the Cancer Grant Challenges, uh, which we recently were awarded to study extrachromosomal DNA. And I'm happy to take uh, a few more questions. Thank you. Uh, th that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Raul. That is an excellent lecture, very interesting material. Th thank you very much for joining us uh, and giving that that lecture today. Uh, we're, ve we're very grateful for that. Now, we do have a, a small number of minutes left for uh, some questions. Uh, can I encourage the audience present to type their questions into the Q&A box, please? Um, and I will start off with a question, if I may. Um, when you were telling us about which cancers are more frequently affected by ECDNA, you were mentioning uh, glioblastoma, sarcoma, esophageal cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, do you have any thoughts or, about why some cancers are affected by a lot of ECDNA and other cancers uh, not so much? Thanks, Mark. That's a great question. So in, in, as a general statement, uh, amplifications are sometimes extrachromosomal. So I think that tumor types where genomic amplifications play a greater role, like glioblastoma being the prime example. That's where you that's where we are also seeing higher frequency of ECDNAs. Now on the other end of the spectrum, you have, for example, acute myeloid leukemia, which you know, has is mostly a diploid genome tumor type. Yeah. Um, although it has to be said that even there, there are several case reports that you can find uh, with MIC um, double minutes, for example. So I don't think there's any tumor type where you would never ever find extra chromosomal DNA, but it, it just is tightly correlated to whether a tumor is um, driven by ampl genomic amplifications or not. Okay, thank you. So we have a question in, in the Q&A box from Shou Chang saying, great talk. Do you think these cancer EC DNAs are also generated via the DNA repair pathways? Yeah, this is a really interesting. So we don't, I don't really have a good answer on how ECDNAs are generated other than to say it's probably through multiple mechanisms. And I think selection plays a key role. So I would have to speculate that ECDNAs are formed through some way or the other. It could be a chromothriptic event occurred. We see that certainly in some subset of ECDNAs that they have a chromothriptic signal. We also see ECDNAs that are consisting of a single or two DNA segments, so that's unlikely to be chromothriptors. So I would speculate that ECDNAs occur sometimes in some cells, but if they provide enough oncogenic signal, they could then get selected for, and that's what, how you end up with them. Uh, but I would say that you know probably even in normal cells, ECDNAs sometimes arise. Fortunately, uh, they are then not they are then met with uh, senescence barriers and whatnot, but. And you know, DNA repair pathways are you know very likely to play some role there. Yeah, um, I should maybe mention that we see ApoBec uh, activity on some ECDNAs. Uh, I don't know that ApoBec is directly linked to DNA repair, but it you know just shows that uh, you, you know ECDNAs are subject to the same processes are as as linear DNA. Sure. Okay, so I think it's time for one last question from Stephen Notley.
who says, you've mentioned some potential targets for treating ECDNA. How well developed are any of these strategies? Which one do you think has the most potential? Yeah, I think none of them have been developed. There's no uh, ECDNA targeting therapies in clinical trials, for example. You could speculate that drugs like the ones that target oncogenes to some degree represent uh, what the effect on ECDNA would be like. So if you take HER2, you can effectively block HER2 in breast cancer. It's, a, it's an effective therapy for, for a subset of breast cancers. I would speculate that in those tumors, if you would treat them with an ECDNA blocking therapy, uh, you might see a similar effect. But this is speculation and we, we just don't have data. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Now, we do have a tradition with the pathology grand rounds of finishing on time, and we've just hit one minute past three. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to give a final thank you. Uh, I, I personally really enjoyed your talk. I'm sure many of the audience uh, will join me in, 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 in thanking you very strongly for such a great lecture. Thanks my, very my much. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me again. Thanks. You. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. And that's the end of the session, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.